NASA. It was the public. It was all over the op-ed pages and the talk shows. The public took ownership of the Hubble Space Telescope because the universe was coming into their bedroom, into their living room, onto their computer. They were a participant on the frontier of, the dis of discovery. And as far as I can tell, if you let them, let them know that it's not simply that we're in the universe, but in fact, given the chemistry of it all and the nuclear physics of it all, not only are we are in the universe, the universe is in us. And I don't know any deeper spiritual feeling than what that brings upon me. And I just wanted to leave you with those thoughts. Thank you. So I, that's, I had to share that with you. I'm sorry I got all emotional there, but... Amen. Amen. <laughs> Are there any questions for Neil? Any comments? Terry has a comment. Oh, yeah, we three, three pounds. Oh, what did I say? 15 pounds? Sorry. Oh, maybe oh. The whole, is the whole head 15 pounds? Okay, so I got the wrong number. <laughs> so your head is 15 pounds, your brain is 3 pounds. Thanks for that correction. So that's brain minus blood, I guess. Yeah. Any other comments? Um, I think uh, Terry had some remarks. So um, I want to pick up, actually, because this is something that actually uh, I had a similar experience when I was uh, at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory uh, in my senior year in um, college and uh, saw the Palomar Sky Atlas, which uh, was a deep, one of the early deep space atlases. It was actually taken uh, at the uh, Palomar uh, Observatory, which is just a few miles away from here, by the way. Uh, and it was uh, a similar feeling of, of being uh, part of a much, much larger and much vaster um, sort of um, arena than I could have ever imagined, just seeing that physical evidence. But there's something else that is also, I think, equally important, and that is that when you make a discovery in astronomy, that uh, you see a supernova that's never been seen before, or analyze uh, uh, a, a rock from the moon that's never been analyzed before, it's humanity doing that for the very first time. Before that, nobody knew what was in the moon rock. And after that, it's in the textbooks. And you can only live through that moment once. Uh, and I had the same feeling when I saw the picture from the back of Saturn, occluding the sun. That's an image that will go down in history. Before that picture was taken, Carolyn Porco showed it. Uh, she obviously had been I've sitting got, on it for quite it, a yeah. while. I've got it. Uh, when, you know, when, that was, when that was done, this is humanity for the very first time putting itself through our technological capability uh, into a position where we could see things that no human, or as far as we know, no other living being has ever been before. So that, that's a very special moment. And we're living through those moments on a daily basis, not just in astronomy, but in biology. It's within our lifetime that we have sequenced the human genome. I once asked Francis Crick if, when they first published that paper on uh, the structure of DNA with uh, Jim Watson, whether it occurred to him that within his lifetime, the structure of DNA, not just the structure of DNA, but the sequence, the base sequence of DNA would actually be worked out. And he said that it never even occurred to him to ask that question. It was inconceivable because the technology at the time was so far be, uh, 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 so, so inefficient and so far behind what we have now that it, you, you could calculate it would be the lifetime of the universe. But it's not just the human genome because now we're systematically sequencing all the genomes and it's going to get faster. And the reason is that, as with computers, that are getting exponentially faster and cheaper the cost of sequencing genomes is getting exponentially faster and cheaper. And they estimate that within our lifetime, 
it will be possible to sequence your genome for $1,000. But it's not just human genomes that we're interested in. We're interested in the whole genome of all creatures that live on the Earth. And why are we interested in that? Well, we're interested because therein is the history of evolution. And the chimp sequence was, for example, worked out just a few years ago. And that was particularly interesting because it is our closest living relative. And it only differs in its DNA by a few percent. Now, that's a small percent, but it actually translates into millions of base pairs. So there's a lot of differences there. And there's a problem because if you see a difference, how do you know whether it is a difference on the line descending to humans or a difference on the way to chimps? Well, it turns out there is a way to figure that out. And uh, I learned it at a symposium that was held right here in this auditorium last Friday. It was sponsored by the La Jolla Group on the Origin of Humans, and it was a symposium on Neanderthals. So humans and Neanderthals coexisted for uh, hundreds of thousands of years. And in fact, up until recently, uh, we're... Uh, in, in, we were living in Europe uh, together with them, I, I presume peacefully, maybe not. But <clears throat> what I learned at the symposium was that an effort is now underway by Savante Pabo to sequence the Neanderthal genome. How could that be? Well, there are bones, and these bones have DNA. They're degraded with time, but even more, making it even more difficult, they're contaminated with human DNA. But it is possible, if you look carefully, to find pieces of bone that have been discarded because it wasn't realized that they were Neanderthal bone. And so no humans touched them or washed them or looked at them. And it turns out that from these samples, you can get fairly good short sequences. And so the effort is now underway to collect enough of these short sequences to completely cover the genome. And so we will know within the next three years the differences between our genome and a species that is extinct. We're going to resurrect an extinct genome. And that will allow us to disambiguate which line the changes occurred on, because our line uh, branched off from the Neanderthals, for example, uh, much, uh, much more recently than that for the chimp. This is all happening during our lifetime. We're going to know the genomes of hundreds of thousands of species. We're going to be able to read the differences and translate that into ultimately an understanding of how it was that we got here. And finally, I think what's, what's missing and actually part of the roller coaster of this last few days for me has been the realization of really how little we know about ourselves and how much disagreement there is, even uh, when we do our best, how much um, ignorance there is and how much humility we need to have in order to be able to make progress. But I think this is a good sign. I think that we have here the opportunity as human beings for the first time. Uh, we have tools and techniques that uh, technology and science has given us. We have ways using brain imaging to study the, uh, the brains not just of monkeys and cats and rats, but also our own brains. Functional Magnetic Resonance Imaging, and it's going to get better. Those techniques are just the first steps we're taking. And ultimately, I think, will give us a much, much better picture and will be able to help inform us on making some of the decisions that are going to be made. And I think that, uh, speaking now as a former physicist, uh, I'm just going to put out a hypothesis about where we are right now. Uh, <clears throat> so. It's all about scaling. How do you scale up from a family to a tribe, from a tribe to a group, a nation, and a nation to a world? Well, if communication is slow, you know, if you have to go by the word of mouth, you can only, it, it really limits the size of the group that you can actually organize, that you could lead. But that's all changed within the last, again, within our lifetime, communications has made it possible for information to be instantly transmitted across the entire globe. We're basically going through another one of these scaling transitions. Uh, nations was a natural unit when you had limited communication with uh, horses and then trains. But, you know, uh, we have the...